Welcome to Stream of Conscience, brought to you by Democracy for America, Fairfield County, where we believe that change is possible and you can make it happen. I'm your host, John Hartwell. Our guest today is Congressman Jim Himes of Connecticut's 4th District. He's currently serving his second term in the House and is a member of the Committee on Financial Services, where he was a key player in the Dodd-Frank Bill reforming the financial services industry. Congressman Himes appeared on Stream of Conscience last summer where we did two shows looking at both domestic and foreign policy. Jim, welcome back to Stream of Conscience. Thanks, John. Great to be here. I'm also joined today by my special co-host, Sarah Dara Littman, an award-winning columnist for Hearst Newspapers in Connecticut and the ConnecticutNewsJunkie.com. Sarah was a Stream of Conscience guest last fall after she wrote a column, Have We Let the Terrorists Win?, in which she talked about her conflicting emotions after the death of U.S. citizen Anwar al awlaki in a targeted killing by American drones. And I've asked her here today as we talk with Congressman Himes about the rule of law in the Bush and Obama administrations. Sarah, welcome back to Stream of Conscience. Thank you, John. Jim, many of us on the left have been dismayed to see policies restricting civil liberties that were brought about in the Bush administration like the Patriot Act, continued under President Obama. Before we get into specifics, could you give us your assessment of civil liberties in the post-9-11 world? Sure, sure. And that's an interesting question because I think it, it gets to um, the way the country has evolved, not just in the last three years of the Obama administration, but uh, since 9-11. Um, and there's no question that in the aftermath, the immediate aftermath of 9-11, People were scared. They were horrified. A Patriot Act was passed that I think most of us would look back on and say was substantially an overstep uh, and a step on our constitutional liberties. And over time, a combination of people getting a little less emotional, a little less scared, realizing the concept that, you know, uh, you don't want to let the terrorists win by having their legacy be our civil rights being scaled back. Uh, and court actions. Uh, the Supreme Court and a variety of courts have obviously scaled back a lot of the fonder ambitions of the Bush administration. W the pendulum has swung back. Uh, it hasn't swung back far enough for many of us, um, but it has swung back. Uh, there are still issues that are uh, difficult for people who think about civil rights, whether it's the ongoing existence of Guantanamo or some of the provisions in the Patriot Act. Um, but I do think that as a country we are gradually, and by the way, against some fairly strident opposition who would keep Guantanamo open, who would never allow for civilian trials, swinging in the right direction. I think, um, I know myself, I was disappointed about the, the vote you took um, giving um, how we had talked in the past about civil liberties on the NDAA. And um, I know that you felt that it didn't actually extend um, any authority of the government on um, indefinite detention. Um, but I'm, I'm not as convinced, um, given what I've read. And, um, and I guess my concern is that, um, that the government, you, you've said that the court has rolled back some of the, the egregious things that happened under the Patriot Act. And what I would say is that on certain things, such as the indefinite detention of American citizens, when there has come, a, a, like on, in the case of Jose Padilla, when, the, when it came to the government going to the Supreme Court to actually have that case heard, they backed down so it was never heard by the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what troubles me, is that the government has, controls the shots when it comes to this, so it, you know, b b they can control whether before it gets to the Supreme Court, whether they back down or not. And so a lot of these cases end up not being heard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Still, I think it's, an, and I'll get to your, your, your specific question about the NDAA, I, I, I think it's hard to deny that uh, the court through Hamdi and through a whole series of other decisions, they found that detainees at uh, Guantanamo had a ha uh, habeas right. They, the court deemed uh, military tribunals at Guantanamo unconstitutional and inconsistent with both the uh, Geneva Conventions and the UCMJ, uh, Uniform Court of Military Justice. Um, and so, yeah, look, it hasn't swung back as far in many instances as we would like. And I think there's two reasons for that. One, some of these problems are just plain hard, and people of goodwill will, uh, and, and different opinions will acknowledge that. You know, 
very bad people, and there are some still in Guantanamo who, for one reason or another, would probably not be successfully prosecuted in either a civilian court or a military court. That's a tough one. You know, we, we track these guys, and we know that an awful lot of them actually do go back to, to, to some, pretty, some pretty horrendous activity. So it, there is one category of very difficult problems, and then there's a category of political issues. You know, the Republican Party in the Congress today would not only keep Guantanamo open, they would, and argued hard for indefinite uh, detention of U.S. citizens captured in the United States. So we also have, of course, a political uh, challenge with some people who fundamentally don't uh, agree, I think, with the position that you outlined. With respect to the NDNA and NDAA and how I think about these things, um, my, my principle and, and has been and will be um, to look at a piece of legislation and ask myself, is this moving us in the right direction? or is it moving us in the wrong direction? If it's moving us in the wrong direction, I'll vote against it. I voted against the Patriot Act uh, in this Congress um, because it was silent on the question of national security letters, which I think are one of the big outstanding questions that we have there without appropriate judicial oversight. So I voted against the Patriot Act. I voted against the original uh, authorization of the uh, NDAA in the um, uh, House because it contained basically an unlimited authorization for the use of military force for the president way too broadly written. I voted for this NDAA because it explicitly excluded um, American citizens from indefinite detention. There is some ambiguity about American citizens captured abroad and classified as enemy combatants. But this is an ambiguity that has existed for a very long time. And so the principle that I try to subscribe to, which is if, if we're doing any harm, first do no harm, and if we are doing harm, vote against it. I think. Uh, uh, was preserved in my vote for the NDAA. Look, I, I'm not going to sit here and pound the table and tell you that that NDAA was a good bill. It was not a good bill. Um, but a guy like me has to balance, you know, what we like about the bill and what we don't like about the bill. I was satisfied it didn't make a bad situation worse. It funded some important things, uh, including our military. And so at the end of the day, I cast my vote in favor of it. I think we should point out for our viewers who might not be as familiar with all of the acronyms that the NDAA was the National Defense Authorization Act and it was passed in December and signed into law by President Obama and that its major provisions funded the troops. But the provisions that we're very concerned about are those which you've touched on and which Sarah has spoken about, the uh, indefinite detention. And one of the claims is that the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, did not further the, the, the power of the president to do things which to us seem to be um, unconstitutional. But in fact, we believe that it did because whereas in the past the President Bush and subsequently President Obama had claimed the ability to keep people in detention who hadn't been tried and who hadn't been convicted and who hadn't necessarily been picked up on the battlefield anywhere. It had never been a statute. And now it's been moved to the point where it's law. Um, and seemingly putting it in a much, uh, you know, a much, more, a much stronger position uh, and, and needs to be somehow rolled back. And as we know, it's very difficult to undo legislation once it's been done. So, in fact, we believe that, that the NDAA extended the power uh, and, and somehow solidified it, which uh, a power that should never have existed to begin with. Yeah, and I, I, look, I don't know that that's right. I mean, the president, both presidents have claimed authority um, mm -hmm. as, a, as a presidential prerogative. Mm -hmm. If they are correct in that interpretation, at the end of the day, that's a, that's a decision ultimately for the Supreme Court. There's nothing the legislature can do about it. So in fact, by codifying something, it is putting a marker down. You may not like that marker. I don't like that marker either. Again, I didn't, yeah, I'm not here to defend uh, the NDA. I'm just here to tell you that on balance, it was, I feel the vote was the right one to cast. Um, by saying that Congress can opine on these things, in some sense, where, you know, arguing with the concept of a unitary executive with the right to unilaterally make these decisions. The statute wasn't great, but it was an awful lot better than the alternative in the Senate, which explicitly gave the president the right to detain U.S. citizens without charge. That was removed, and the statute explicitly uh, prohibits 
uh, the indefinite detention of U.S. citizens, and it also gives, and I, this is half a loaf at best, but it also gives the Secretary of Defense and the President the right to waive the, otherwise the obligation to try people in military tribunals, which, you know, I wish that we approached it the other way, which is that the default is that we try terrorist suspects in civil court, if necessary, try them in a military tribunal. But again, it's, you know, we have some distance yet to go. Right, but this bill, in fact, requires that non-citizens be tried in military tribunals. And, it, and what it is, if I remember the, the language, it says that it, um, it's not a requirement for U.S. citizens, but it allows that to happen by, by default. Um, so at the discretion of the president. At the discretion that's right. of the president. That's right. That's what I'm referring and, and to. The president has a waiver right, which, again, right. I'm not comfortable with. Uh, and, and, and by the way, I think we're into the details here, but I think the president can exercise that waiver with respect to non-U.S. citizens as well. So in other words, a non-U.S. citizen captured either on the battlefield or in the U.S. could, at the election of the president, election being the key word there, and the uncomfortable word, be tried in, in civil court. But, but see, this, this is what really disturbs me, that... Um, investing such powers in the president, I mean, is this not why we fought the Revolutionary War? Um, to get away from, you know, investing our, our legal rights in the power of one capricious man. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, every day we do that, right? We have prosecutors in this country who have profound uh, uh, discretion. But we, but, but we, we have the right in the Constitution to be tried by a jury of our peers. Right, right. And, and this is taking that away. Yeah, and look, I, you know, I'm not, uh, like I said, you know where I stand on this. You know, I wish that the presumption were that, uh, that, that people would be, that, that detainees or terrorist suspects would be tried in civilian court and in certain narrow exceptions. And there are some exceptions where, you know, highly confidential data is involved or whatever, uh, where you would want to use a military tribunal. You know, look, there's a tradition for that, you know, starting well before World War II and the Nuremberg trials and that sort of thing. So I, I, I agree with you. I wish we were configured the other way around, but, you know, I'm one of 435 guys. And there are some people in Congress who believe that we should never use uh, civilian trials, that it's okay to lock up a U.S. citizen in a Navy brig in South Carolina indefinitely. Uh, that's not the uh, approach I take to things. Um, and, you know, I, I'm here to tell you we've got a long way to go, uh, and it will, be, uh, it will be acts of Congress. It will be a change in the political, well, in the way people feel about these things. Um, I, I haven't looked at the polling on this. I've never polled on it myself. but you know, people are still scared out there. And I'm not sure, even in Fairfield County, uh, that I would tell you that a majority of people would say that we should shut down Guantanamo and free those who can't be tried. So we do have a way to go, ways to go yet. I'm certain that there's not a majority who say we should shut down Guantanamo and free those who haven't been tried. That, uh, I don't think you would find that anywhere in the country. And it's an awful legacy of the Bush administration that they put us in a position of having captured people or bought them, because I think that happened in a lot of places where they just paid bounty money to somebody to bring somebody in. Those people have been stuck in Guantanamo for 10 years, some of them, and uh, we can't find a place to put them. We tortured some of, some of them. We could never try them in a civilian court because their, their rights have been uh, extraordinarily um, offended. And yet here we are, with, and the Congress is not allowing the president to do anything. What do we do in a situation like this? We can't let this exist forever. These people can't be kept on that island for the rest of their lives. You know, you've got some hard cases like the ones you talk about there where, and you objected to my saying no one would support letting him go. Look, if this were a criminal, a truly criminal situation without the terrorist overlay, um, law enforcement would let him go. You know, if they violated Miranda rights or any of the other constitutional rights that we put around a criminal suspect, they would be let go. Um, that has implications in this world that are pretty terrifying. It's not just that somebody's going to go out there and rob more cars, right? There's some terrifying implications. You know, that said, um, you know, in as much as there's good news here, and I don't fundamentally disagree with anything you just said, but in as much as there's good news, it lies in the fact that 
you know, the president has taken down the number of detainees held at Guantanamo. Uh, there are probably some who can be tried either in civilian courts or in tribunals. And then you're right. Then we're going to be down to a small handful of people who perhaps were tortured, and consequently there's probably no venue in which they can be tried. Um, and we're going to need to figure out how to work with their home countries and work with Europe and Interpol and everything else on some kind of disposition for those people. And I am not a smart enough to know, guy to know exactly what the right answer is. Sure, we could do what we do with auto theft and you know auto thieves and let them go, um, but some proportion of them are going to go back to to terrorism. I think um, uh, you know when I'm reading though is that it's not just a, a Republican Democrat issue here because there are a lot of people on the right who are just as upset. You know when you look at libertarians, they are just as upset about the civil liberties um, implications. Of, of the NDAA as I am, as someone on the left. Um, you know, this isn't a right or left issue. As far as I'm concerned, this is an American issue. Um, and, um, you know, and, and as far as when I look at you, to me, you're my line in the sand. You know, you're my protection. <laughs> and when I vote for you, I am looking for you to protect. You know, your vote is my protection against you know, the people who are trying to take those rights away. And I think that's why, personally, I felt so disappointed. Um, yeah, look, I, I, I resist, just as a practical matter, framing things as American or un-American, though I'm tempted to agree. Look, we're a great country because we're willing, or at least we say we're willing to bear a cost for the liberties that we have enumerated in our Bill of Rights. Oftentimes in the practical world, people are actually not willing to bear a cost, or they agree with the Bill of Rights in as much as it guarantees things they agree with. I know it's beyond the scope of this discussion, but we witnessed it last week when we had a conflict between you know, the obvious public good of, of birth control availability for everybody and you know, a serious constitutional issue around the free exercise of religion. People tend to agree with the Constitution and think of things as American when it's consistent with what they what they like, but you know, when it's marching, when it's uh, Nazis marching in Skokie, Illinois, all of a sudden that First Amendment right doesn't feel quite as good. Um, and, and look, we also need to recognize that there's some tough ones. I mean, John made reference to your article about Al Laki, who mm. uh, was killed, um, American citizen. That is a profoundly scary thing, um, uh, and and I don't know exactly where that line lives. Look, I voted against. Uh, everything this president wanted to do in Libya because the Constitution says that the Congress gets to declare war. And this argument that the White House made about, you know, because there are no boots on the ground, we're not at war, I think it would have been a surprise to an awful lot of people in Libya to say that we were not at war. Um, but I can't argue with the outcome. Look, mm. Gaddafi's gone. We didn't put boots on the ground. We worked together with the Arab League. It was a it's not the right word to use, but it was the right outcome. I mean, obviously a lot of people died, so you don't use that word comfortably, but it was the right practical outcome. Um, but it was an affront to the Constitution. So these, this tension between what's actually happening on the ground and what our Bill of Rights and what the Constitution says is a very real tension where I think it's, I think we should not never, but be careful about painting the world in good and evil, American or un-American. It's difficult not to at times. Um, and of course, I believe that the Bush administration um, majored in, <laughs> in, a, in a Manichaean, black, white, good, bad, you're with us or you're against us kind of world, um, and forcefully backed that up with a variety of things, some of which we knew about at the time, like the Patriot Act, some of which we didn't, like warrantless wiretapping that wasn't discovered or wasn't at least allowed to be seen uh, until well after a time when we could have removed that administration and, and replaced it with something better. Um, and, and then the Congress followed up, and you weren't there at the time, to codify that into law and to, and to give a pass to the uh, telecommunications industry, which willingly participated in what was clearly uh, unconstitutional. I'm surprised that there hasn't been any court case that's made its way up to, to undo that as well. But I think what my problem is, is that s certainly since 9-11, that we have seen a series of actions by the government which, some of which were completely wrong, some of which might have been on the fence, depending on which way you looked at it, but 
taken in toto have severely, substantially degraded the civil liberties of, this, of the people in this country and have also um, made their way in, made us internationally into a force that is no longer seen as a force for good. We now seem to be uh, a force for force. And it's deeply disturbing um, to see what's happened to this country and, and to see how we are viewed in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and look, I think I, I, two two thoughts that I would append to your to, to what you just said. One is, um, I think the way we're perceived, and the president made this point in the State of the Union. I think the way we're perceived has changed dramatically. Maybe too strong a word, but meaningfully, um, you know, as a result of this president's activities abroad. The other thing I would say is, um, yeah, there were huge uh, violations of our civil liberties. Um, by the Bush administration and arguably continuing today. Um, but this is not a first for this country. We are all too often ready as a people to throw our civil liberties overboard when things get bad. We have not put American citizens into concentration camps as a result of 9-11, but our parents did that mm. in the 1940s. U.S. citizens of Japanese descent sent off to camps. Um, we uh, Jose Padilla, I think, spent a lot of time in what is essentially a concentration camp. He was in a Navy brig where he was not allowed to see a lawyer for more than a year, and he was an American citizen, and he was done at the whim of the administration. So yes, we didn't put thousands of people into camps like we did in World War II, but the process started. And then instead of mm -hmm. putting the camps in California or wherever, they established Guantanamo and they threw whomever they wanted from the rest of the world in. Yeah, there. but there is no, I won't accept that there's a parallel between putting innocent American citizens who happen to just have Japanese last names. There's no parallel between that and Guantanamo. You, you, we just can't be that morally no, no, uh, no, but, rigid. But, and and uh, one other thought, the point I'm making here is that we shouldn't think that this is some you know, one-off, staggering aberration with what happens when Americans get scared. The very next decade after the 1940s, one United States Senator, McCarthy, ruined the careers of thousands of people and got this country into, into a sort of insane, red-baiting communist hunt that did us right. no good. I'm not going to argue with you on the fine points of whether Guantanamo looks like Japanese detention camps. I'm just saying we would learn a broader lesson about how Americans behave through their representative government when they get scared. Yeah. Yes, well, it's funny because Peter King sort of is ha holding another Muslim radic radicalization hearing bout of rad you know hearings um, I just read yesterday, and to me that sounds very reminiscent of just what McCarthy did. He's singling out a group of people. Um, He's not holding radicalization hearings. He's holding Muslim radicalization hearings. Yeah. Um, no, and I used to sit on that committee, you know, and I and I watched him with, uh, you know, with a, with a with a great deal of sadness, um, you know. Again, and I'm look, I, I I am appalled by what Peter, the way Peter King has uh, has dealt with this, particularly given his own background. With, well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a whole other topic, but um, but I also think, again, you know, not that we should be patting ourselves on the back for that, but there is a very diff real difference between what what Peter King is doing and what Senator McCarthy did. Um, but no, I, look, I share your even if they if it wasn't didn't make us all feel dirty as Americans, it's a colossally bad practical thing to do. You know, we find terrorists because you know, uh, people in Islamic communities in mosques around this country in the Midwest feel comfortable with their government, with the local police force and with the federals and they've got good, they've got good relationships and this is, this is a step in, 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 in obliterating the kinds of relationships that allow us to identify people who are the, the tiny, tiny percentage of people who ultimately do get radicalized. Exactly. Um, and um, just on the other point about, you know, we're not having concentration camps. I mean, the whole case of Brandon Mayfield, um, uh, who you know was an innocent person who was picked up um, and you know falsely prosecuted, held for two weeks, and um, tortured, uh, you know, by the American government, and ended up getting a I think two, you know huge settlement. Um, so I mean, this stuff is going on in our country. Mm -hmm. Um, and I find it profoundly disturbing. Yeah, yeah, no, look, and what you're doing and what DFA is doing is important. At the end of the day, representatives of the government respond, believe it or not, and it is true, and I've been there for three years and I continue to say it, people respond 
to their constituents. Um, you know, I don't know how Peter King's constituents feel about what he's doing, but my guess is that if they hated it, he might not be doing it. Right. Um, and so, you know, advocacy and um, you know, people being willing to draw the line and say, "Look, I, you know, I hate what your version of free speech is." But what was it Voltaire said? But I'll die to the death to for your, or go to the death <laughs> for your right to, to make the, to make the speech. So, yeah, I mean, again, I, I don't. All of us are uncomfortable with uh, an awful lot of the response with respect to civil liberties after 9/11. But I do think it is fair to say that uh, we didn't respond with the kind of with the kind of horror that, you know, the internment of the Japanese American citizens represented. Well, we, we've only got a little bit of time left, so I'd like to know where you think we should go with these kinds of concerns, where, where the next line should be drawn. I mean, to, to us, the military, you know, the, the National Defense Authorization Act was a disaster. Um, and, you know, what's the next thing on the horizon? Because we, we definitely want to keep this, this kind of issue front and center because it's, it's fundamental to who we are as a people. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's three ways in which change is happening. Um, one is through the courts, um, and as individuals, there's not a ton that you know, we can do to influence that. Two is through, its, um, through the representative process, which is happening right now. I hear you on the NDAA. Um, I, don't, I don't agree with you, but I don't violently disagree with you either. Um, but by the way, I, I, don't, I, I don't think that in this overall effort to get us back on track on civil liberties, I'm your big problem. You may disagree with my NDAA vote, but I, you know, as a, as a junior member of Congress, voted against an authorization on this uh, a year ago and voted against the Patriot Act. I'm willing to take some political risks to do what I think is right. More people need to, um, uh, and, and, and more people need to express to their representatives that they understand and want a bias towards civilian trials. And by the way, you don't even need to be a lawyer or a naive flower child to make that case. Make the case that thousands of terrorists have been successfully prosecuted mm. in civilian court and a handful have been, uh, have been uh, tried under military tribunals and most of those ended in you know, people ultimately going free. So I mean there's some very practical things that can be said to representatives in Congress to try to, uh, per to, try to persuade them. Um, and lastly is just um, you know, the media is important. Yeah. Just the general discussion out there um, needs to be more acknowledging of, um, more acknowledging of the, the, the fear and the pain that we, must and the, that we must be willing to tolerate if we are to be serious about preserving our constitutional rights. Well, Jim, thank you very much for coming in today uh, for a serious discussion about a very important topic. Thanks, John. Thank and you, Sarah. Sarah, thank you. Mm, thanks for having me. I hope you'll come back again soon. Anytime. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to learn more about progressive, grassroots political action, please check out our Democracy for America group. We meet the first Wednesday of the month at the Silver Star Diner in Norwalk, and we'd love to have you join us. Remember, change is possible, and you can make it happen. This has been Stream of Conscience, and I'm your host, John Hartwell. Thanks for watching. <laughs>